us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who's given us grace unto thy servants by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal trinity and the power of the divine majesty to worship the unity. We beseech thee that thou wouldst keep us steadfast in the faith and evermore defend us from all dangers and adversities. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Verse 3 of hymn 94. To you in David's town this day is born of David's line, the Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this shall be the sign. <clears throat> well, we are in volume eight of Peter Vermiglini's library. Um, Dr. Torrance Kirby is clearly of the mind that uh, he has been airbrushed out of English history due to the historiographical school of uh, English exceptionalism, which I take to be English pride. Nothing south of the channel can teach us a thing. The general editors are this John Patrick Donnelly, a Jesuit, double doctor Frank James and Joseph McClelland. Editorial committee includes Dr. Torrance Kirby, William Klempa, Paula Presley, Robert Schnucker. Volume 8 is the library. This, uh, this one translated and edited by Frank James, whose two doctorates were on Vermiglity. Um, what else can we say here? Uh, the copyright was transferred to Davenant Trust in 2018, Moscow, Idaho. Peculiar. This is volume is dedicated to my colleagues. Uh, it's got a prolegomena. Wait a minute here. I'm sorry. Prolegomena. Well, it's got the gen abbreviation, general editor's preface, translator's preface, translator's introduction, which is fairly large, I think, as I remember. Looking ahead here, and then it's got articles one through, well, part one is on predestination. Part two is on justification with all of his various proposition about the editor and translator, scripture references, abbreviations, and now for the Jesuits intro. <clears throat> the reputation of Peter Vermigli, 1499. 1562 rests largely on his role in the sacramentarian controversies of his time. And by the way, Jesuits got some good scholars. Very good. The partial perception distorts his career as a biblical exegete. Volume 6 in our library. I'm going to have to find this. Commentary on the Lamentations of the Prophet Jeremiah presents one of Vermiglii's last presents one of her lecture series presented after he left Italy to join Martin Busser at Strasbourg. The present volume returns to Vermigli's next academic appointment as Regis Professor at Divinity at Oxford. He chose to lecture on Romans <laughs> to address the ills of the church and society, a fitting compliment to his lectures on 1 Corinthians. Oh, boy. We get into the Lord's Supper. The present book consists of only two treatises contained in Martin's large and influential Romans commentary. They are among the longest of his loci, those commonplace devices in vogue from the latter Middle Ages and used increasingly by Martyr in his lectures, at least in their published form. These are two, these two are full blown tracts methodically developed and seeking to cover the chief heads of doctrine. The doctrines of predestination and justification are familiar shorthand for the, for the Reformed faith. This is a Jesuit talking. <laughs> Each form the center of a minor war of words and conferences. Minor? 
pitting the Reformed against the Roman, Lutheran, and Anabaptist opponents. It is fortunate that in Frank James we have a scholar well acquainted with both topics and Vermigli's texts. Dr. James has studied and commented on them th through many years in two doctorates. We are proud to introduce his first contribution to our library through two of Vermigli's substantive texts on disputed questions. As Dr. James's introduction makes clear, the polemical context informs Vermigli's teaching and provides foils for his attack. Here we meet such adversaries as Richard Smith of Oxford and Calvin's old foe, Albert Piggius, as well as Tridentine doctors. Within this volume, series one of our library's two thirds, series one of our library is two thirds complete. The remaining books are commentaries on Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics and the biblical books of Genesis, Romans, and 1 Corinthians. Series two is now in the planning stage. When was this published? Hardcover originally published 2003. I don't know if the rest of it has been published. I'm gonna, again, again, he's very influential at Lambeth. And almost, I think, I'm going to venture a bold thesis that what Vermigli taught Cranmer largely followed. Let's see if that's so. We hope that these translations of Martyr's writing will encourage scholars to engage this admirable theologian and will show why he is significant, if neglected, player on the complex stage of the Reformation. Now for Frank James, he was a classmate at Westminster. I went off into the military. He went off into further studies. Actually did his original work in Dallas and somehow ended up in a THM class sitting next to me and Dr. Uh, Philip Hughes's class. And then he, for some reason, dropped, disappeared. I don't know what happened anyways. First PhD for D. Phil was at Oxford, and then he took his second at Westminster. Predestination and justification are two of the most distinctive doctrines associated with the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. This volume presents Peter Vermigli's most extensive discussions on these controversial theological principles drawn from his monumental commentary on the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans. It has long been my goal to understand the theological dynamics of Vermigli's ecclesiastical transformation from a Roman Catholic theologian to a Protestant theologian, to theological loci, one on predestination and the other in justification, provide important avenues by, what, by which one may gain insight into that profound transformation. Not only did these two doctrines play a significant role in Vermigli's decision to abandon Rome, they also became the theological realms, besides sacramental theology, in which Vermigli made most important contributions to the theology of the Reformed branch of Protestantism. Having access to these loci will enable scholars of the 16th century to gain additional insight into the theological and biblical thing, thinking of one of the most formative thinkers of the Reformation, and perhaps most importantly, allow a glimpse into theological diversity among the early reformers. My early scholarly effort on Vermiglii, a doctoral dissertation at Oxford University on the historical origins of this doctrine of predestination brought unconventional conclusions. I expected to find a viewpoint that mirrored Calvin's, but found instead a theological perspective largely inspired by the fourth century Augustinian Gregory of Rimini. I don't know why that should have been surprising. I don't know how that's surprising at all. It seems that 
Heiko Oberman's quest for a theological link between the early Reformation. Okay, I'm busy, young man. Okay, this is my second grandkid. <laughs> Life. Oh, careful. It seems that Heiko Oberman's quest for a theological link between the early Reformation and the late medieval Skull Augustine. Augustiana Moderna has been found in Vermegli. And they gave him a PhD for that conclusion. My interest in Vermegli was sufficient to inspire yet another doctoral dissertation, this time in theology at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. The goal was to develop deeply into one of the most distinctive Protestant doctrines, justification, and to measure Vermigli's understanding against the great theological views of his day, Catholic, Lutheran, and Reformed. And he's just made him a big mistake. Catholic. That's, sorry, that's reserved for Protestants. But he's playing a game here to please his friends. Again, expectations as to what Vermiglii would say on the topic had to be reconfigured. I anticipated that he would be in conformity with the Lutherans and reformed against the Catholics. Instead, what emerged from the research was a much more nuanced understanding of justification Vermiglii did retain some of the features of the Catholic Reform Movement in Italy, especially those of the group associated with Juan de Valdez. It may sound obvious from the distance of nearly 500 centuries, but Vermigli was, while clearly indebted to Lutheran, Luther was not Lutheran on the matter of justification, or for that matter, were many of his Reform colleagues such as Calvin, Bullinger, and Busser. Where's Cranmer? Come on, come on, Frank. The doctrinal divide that became apparent over time was evident early on in Vermigli's doctrine of justification. One of the lasting impressions gained from research into Vermigli's thought is his profound biblical orientation. In some ways, that is his lasting legacy. If one had asked Peter Martyr how he would like to be remembered, he might have pointed to his Bible and stated that he only wanted to promulgate the teachings of the scripture. More work needs to be done on his theology, especially on his biblical commentaries. To that end, the Peter Martyr Library Editorial Committee is now focusing on translations of his commentaries. Special thanks to the managing editor of Peter Martyr Library, Paula Presley, whose untiring efforts and high standards make this a superb series. Finally, I thank my graduate assistant, Kate Maynard, for her efforts on behalf of the project, and for Daniel Timman of the Theologisch Universita Appledorn for help in identifying obscure references. I do owe a debt to my colleagues, Pat Donnelly and Joe McClellan, who have provided enormous assistance in the preparation of this volume. I am overcome with gratitude for the ge generosity and support of this American Gen Jesuit and Canadian Presbyterian. I'm especially grateful for the assistance and composition of footnotes. This dedication is a small token of my affection and appreciation for these extraordinary colleagues. And for Frank James III, he, he's a descendant of Jesse James, true. And he was rather proud of that, proud of it, but he noted it. December 2002, feast day of St. Nino, Orlando, Florida. I don't know why he didn't. Something went on down there. Now he's laboring in some obscure little school up in Philadelphia. It's the president. I don't know what all he's doing, but seems to have retired from 
academics. We got a picture here by Hans Osper, painted 1560, courtesy of the National Portrait of London. Now the translator's introduction. A long introduction, very long. Goes on for some uh, 44 pages, starting at page 15. A lot of footnotes. It is a measure of Peter Martyr Vermigli's influence in England that his regal portrait by Hans Ospers included in the National Portrait in London. <clears throat> the piercing brown eyes of a rather handsome Peter Martyr look beyond the confines of his gilded frame as he points to his Bible, as you can see there. This portrait captures something of the true spirit of this Italian theologian. And I hope you make it clear also of Thomas Cranmer. There's not a, there's not a nano inch, there's not even a, there's, there's not even a razor bladed difference between the two. It is as if in full academic regalia, he is instructing his students to concentrate their undivided attention on this book alone, as, he, as much as he urged in his Oxford oration, let us immerse ourselves constantly in the sacred scriptures, let us work at reading them by the gift of Christ's spirit, the things that are necessary for salvation will be clear, direct, and open. Footnote 2 from Martyr's Exhortation for you is to study sacred scriptures. Vermigli's fame rested in large part upon his erudite biblical commentaries. Wherever his journey led him, he could be found lecturing on the biblical text, whether in his early career as a Catholic theologian lecturing monks. She needs to say Romanist, not Catholic. Sorry, Frank. Let's see if he continues to make this bad mistake. You gotta suck up to the Romanists and the Jesuits, do you, Frank? Lecturing monks at Naples and Lucca, and later Protestant academies at Strasbourg, Zurich, and Oxford. During his lifetime, his lectures on 1 Corinthians, Romans, and Judges were published. His lectures on Genesis, Lamentations, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings were published posthumously. And I see there's a German translation. All over Migli, he had wide-ranging theological and polemical interests to which he devoted many pages. There's little doubt that his primary calling was as a biblical commentator. We've got a footnote here. It's store of... By Frank, Frank again, Peter Vermigli e. in Historical Handbook of Biblical Interpreters, edited by Donald McKinn. Along with Calvin and Bullinger, Vermigli e. was among the leading representatives of the Reformed tradition of biblical commentators and other Footnote to Peter Lilback, president of Westminster. It's in a paper. These guys, I don't know why they have not more, get more visibility. To begin to understand the martyr, one must appreciate that he was first and foremost a man of the book, a biblical scholar. Peter Vermigli in England, thank you. Vermigli's success in England left a bitter taste in the mouths of Catholics. When his wife, Catherine Dump Martin of Metz, died in Oxford in February 1553, Catholic hostility directed at her husband, unfortunately, found its mark in her. Even while alive, 
Catherine was the brunt of brutal sarcasm orally and in print. See George Gorham gleanings of a few scattered years during the period of the Reformation in England and times succeeding 1533. We're going to make a note here and see if we can find that. Also, the history of the University of Oxford. I, in Smith's Grand and the Reformation under yeah, I think I've seen that. I think that's a Roman Catholic, I think. But she because she was a corpulent woman. See, and he says the Catholics, he's saying the papists. At Oxford nicknamed her flaps and fustal lugs shortly after Catherine's death. Mary Tudor ascended to the English throne and a widowed Vermigli returned to Strasbourg, Strasbourg. So I guess she was buried at Oxford. However, hatred for Vermigli ran so high among Rome. I'm going to just go ahead and say Romanists since Frank doesn't have the gonads to do it. That he sought to cause him distress by desecrating the body of his late wife, number seven, Archbishop Reginald Pole. I don't I think I'll just start calling him Pole Cat uh, for the remainder here. Once a close friend of Vermigli in Italy, had Catherine's body exhumed and cast upon a city dung heap, number eight. This is awful ostensibly because she had been buried in close proximity to the grave of St. Frideswide, the patron saint of Oxford in the cathedral church. But the Romanists did not have the final word on Catherine's remains after Elizabeth six. Uh, and you can see here, get a picture, listener and reader. This is what the Romanists were about. After Elizabeth's ascension in 1558 and the return of the Marian exiles, Catherine's bones were recovered from the dung heap and deliberately mingled with the bones of St. Fried's with White. Any de desecration thereafter would risk desecrating the bones of St. Fried's Worth, a, most, a risk most papists would be unwilling to take. The deplorable episode dramatically illustrates the range of emotions the English felt for the Italian immigrant theologian, detractors and advocates alike, viewed Vermigli e at a particular as a particularly important symbol of Edwardian reform. C. H. Smith writes, Oxford, which had not taken kindly to the Renaissance, was violently hostile to the Reformation. The whole of Peter Martyr's works was almost single-handedly a struggle against overwhelming odds. And again, we've got Smith noted here. Whether Vermigli intent inspired intense animosity or devoted affection, it cannot be doubted that during his nearly six years in England, he exercised a decisive influence upon the Reformation. So 1547, after Henry dies, and he's with Cranmer, I think, in 1559 at Lambeth. As, according to Dr. Kirby, the, the tutor of Tom Cranmer, he tutored, Cranmer was not embarrassed to have recognized seniors. Imagine the dinner at that table, Grandmer's family, and you no, know, we did. Did we get a date on the death of his wife? Yeah, 1553. I venture to say she moved down there to Lambeth with him. Of course, the earliest Protestant theological influence was that of Luther. Wrong, is Wingley whose books and pamphlets were smuggled into England by German merchants and read in Cambridge in 1520. 
March 1521, Luther's books were publicly burned for the first time in England. That is in uh, some of these books are more modern, so we're not going to be able to get them unless you know an archive. Have to go buy the hard copies. It's a scam. It's a money thing. Were publicly burned for the first time in England. Even before the death of Henry VIII, January, 28 January 1547, a new kind of Protestant influence began to take root on English soil. A theological view more Swiss and Reformed than German and Lutheran. That uses a footnote to McCulloch's The Latter Reformation in England and Dickens' The English Reformation. It's just too bad American Episcopalians are unconscious, brain dead. And Anglicans, too, want to hang on to Luther and flip-flop around here and there without recognizing the historic posture. I, I, I give up on ACNA. Archbishop Thomas Cranmer of Canterbury had been in correspondence with the Swiss reformer of Basel, Simon Grenaeus, since 1531. And through Grenaeus, Cranmer became a frequent correspondent of Martin Bucer through Grenaeus. Uh, and a correspondent of Martin Bucer of Strasbourg. The relationship with the Swiss manifested itself in an abortive plan to form a theological alliance between the English church and the Swiss and Southern Germans on the continent. Again, a reference to Cranmer, a Dermot McCulloch's Cranmer. For some years, Cranmer had designed, desired to improve the ties between the English church and continental Protestantism. With much of continental Protestantism in disarray, disarray after the victory of Charles V in the Schmalkald War. Cranmer believed England could be the rallying point for a resurgent Protestantism. He even made plans to compose a common doctrinal statement and to hold a godly synod of continental and English Protestants to counter the effects of the Council of Trent. This is good to see. This is wonderful. Conferring with such theologians as John Calvin, Philip Melanchthon, and Henry Bullinger about the proposal. Hint, hint, and Melanchthon, leave your Eucharist views at home if we get it together. This is, he refers to the J.E. Cox's works of Bishop and also Gorham's gleanings. When Edward VI succumbed to tuberculosis, Cranmer's dreams were deferred. But we'll draw that to a close here, and we got some good things to think about. Um, just a few problems here and there, but largely, you know, largely most impressive and thankful for his scholarship. Verse 4 of Hymn 94, the heavenly babe. You there shall find to human view displayed all meanly wrapped in swaddling bands and in a manger laid. Let us pray. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing now and forevermore. Amen.